One big mistake that I see with a lot of especially digitally native brands is when they go into retail, suddenly those teams start to be a different part of the business. My opinion on this is, is once you enter retail, that is a gigantic source of brand awareness that is driving halos across your business. So they should be talking to your performance teams. Many brands don't. Chew on this. First guest that I believe is somebody that's on the complete opposite side of the the table where usually we have brand owners, founders, um, marketers that are doing, you know, marketing for, for brands. We actually have somebody from the big boss, G Google, <laughs> Zach Cox, growth lead, retail commerce. Zach, thanks for being here. I like to call out some of the guys that we actually hit up at Meta and TikTok. <laughs> Google actually beat you to the chew on this podcast. So super excited to, to have you here. Um, I think just kick it off, like, you know, what's your what's your background? How'd you end up at Google and, and what are you doing there? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I've been at Google for about four years and uh, really working with retail and e-commerce, CPG brands um, that whole time and helping them make more money faster. Um, and before that, I, I, was, I was in college, so I actually got recruited right out of school. Wow, that's huge. It's incredible. So you work directly with, I guess, what kind of brands are you working with right now? So just like a lot of the e-commerce, like, you know, any any brand, any of those digitally native brands, like those are the ones that I've, I've worked with, uh, or my team, I should say, is, has worked with, uh, you know, and a lot of them have also products that they sell in stores, you know, so your CPG uh, and D2C and also like some retailers as well. Oh, that's awesome. So I think I want to kind of kick things off with... Um, I guess some of the tools that are offered at Google, right? Um, if you know me and you you follow the chew on this podcast, like my my background and my like main skill set is media buying on Meta, right? I've I've followed that since 2015 up until now, so I've seen the changes there. I've been able to to navigate uh, and kind of like go with the flow of what's coming out, right? So I think Meta's newest and I guess brightest of the future is is ASC. All right. Um, and what does that stand for? And ASC is Advantage Shopping Campaigns. Okay. Right. I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what actually ends up happening is that it's a a new algorithm that Meta's kind of put out there. Uh, you're basically giving all your assets to Facebook and them basically targeting whoever, and and you're, it's like a black box, right? Now, on the other hand, Google has always been known for search ads, PPC, shopping, YouTube, right? Um, but the latest thing that has come out and has been out for a little bit is is Pmax, right? And for for marketers, at least on like D 2 C Twitter, like everyone's talking about Meta, Meta performance, this, that, like nobody really touches on Google, and I and I really think that's a lot of companies' downfall because you could literally reach consumers where they re like legitimately are instead of trying to create awareness on meta then get them to the website and purchase right right away right so in fact i think it's easier to get people to convert on google so i definitely want to dive into pmax how can how should people be thinking about using this in their business especially for e-commerce businesses right well first of all i really appreciate the question um when i think about the role that performance max plays for advertisers it's really in that demand capture space. You guys named it really well. It is somebody who is searching for a product that you sell and you wanna make sure that you show up for them when they're searching for you. And it is the product that allows you to do that. Got it. So at least from my perspective, we've done a lot of heavy lifting to get content created, right? And I think a lot of what everybody's talking about now is creator strategists, UGC, you know, customer testimonials, a lot of video, video like video heavily focused. All those assets I've created, how can I kind of repurpose that on Google's end? And can I? Yeah, well, a lot of, in my experience from what I've seen, a lot of the time you can. Within Performance Max, you get the ability to leverage video assets. So to your point, if you have some of those video assets that you can take over, you. You can use that, and that's part of the beauty of of that solution. Um, but what I find uh, to double click on the YouTube, on the video side is that when you have video assets, I mean, Performance Max is great, but there are other places you can use that too. 
um, which is where YouTube can play a big role for brands as well. I think also one one thing here is that when marketers talk about Google and people are kind of like showcasing the results on Google and and they're and they're and they're seeing these like insane results, right? Like 10x return, 15x return. It's like, okay, well, is branded part of that, right? A lot of the argument, it's like, well, people are just searching for your brand and clicking on the ad and they would have converted anyways, right? How is, how, what is Google's position on like, how do you drive net new traffic? How do you drive net new customers into the ecosystem? Um, like, how do you guys think about that and, and pushing that on, on marketers? Right. Um, well, within Performance Max, there is a setting that you can actually tell. I mean, to take a step back, I think Google or any other platform, it's all about the inputs that you give it. If you aren't liking what you're getting, you've got to reevaluate what your inputs are. So what are you telling the system to go give you and go get you? So in this case, if you're interested in new customers, there actually is a switch that you can flip on that you can say, hey, optimize towards capturing new customers. So your Performance Max campaign can go out and capture new customers for you if that's what you're interested in. Talk a little bit more about that. What does that actually mean? Like what would be the difference between having that on versus off? It just depends on, you know, well, having it on versus having it off, I think in my experience from what I've seen, it, it, it's not like it's not going to get you new customers. It's more, again, it comes down to, do you want only new, I mean, it comes down to the inputs. Are you explicitly saying, I want only this, then go out and get this from me, as opposed to you saying, hey, go out and get me sales, which is, I mean, performance max. It will generally, from what I've seen, if you tell it to go and get you sales, then that is what the the campaign will optimize to go get you. Got it. So, but that could also mean like branded, Keywords, branded shopping, and stuff like that. There's that. Overlap. You can you can exclude that yeah. if you want right. as well. Um, that is something that was updated pretty recently. Yeah. So um, I'd love to kind of even dig a little bit uh, deeper into like being able to have the exposure to data um, on on a level of kind of a bird's eye view to all these brands, right? Um, and again, not going to go into particular brands and stuff like that. But, um, I think one thing, whenever you talk to anyone who aggregates data, studies it, learns from it, um, I think they're typically the people who have the best read and prediction on where the market's going, how the market's performing and, you know, what are some places that are kind of the low hanging fruit? Um, maybe you can start with a couple of points around like, What's going on in the market right now? What are you, what is truly, you know, I, I see some people that will randomly be like, yeah, consumer behavior is down right now. And then there's some people who are like, I'm having the best months of my life on the brand. And the, that, that's, that kind of separation is there because it truly is that wide. But then there's a median, right? And what is that median really at? Can you maybe share what you're, where we really are average out to um, in the market right now? Sure. You mean in terms of like consumer, 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 buy, behavior, consumer behavior, shopping. buyer behavior, shopping. Sure. Yep. Sure. Um, well, I would say, you know, if you look at data that's published by the NRF and others, you know, retail activity is a little bit up year on year mm. uh, in terms of shopping behavior. And it's returning to pre-pandemic standards, though. So what that means is unlike in COVID, you're not seeing the same huge spikes year on year on year. Uh, because people aren't stuck in their homes just yeah. online shopping all the time. So, you know, to give a very broad macro point of view based on those data points that I shared, I'd say like that's that's what I look at. Um, but zeroing in more on D2C in that category, I think that you have to think about the priorities across different brands. It's no longer a, a growth at all costs yeah. environment anymore. And not being a grow at all cost en environment, uh, which I agree. Um, are there are there certain brands or certain industries that are doing something that's a little bit more unique to navigate growth still? Uh, because grow at all cost, like not having grow at all cost anymore being kind of the North Star doesn't mean you don't grow. So what what are some of those other tactics? Can you maybe share two tactics that people are doing that are a little bit more unique um, in their in their growth strategy? 
Absolutely. So one, I think I have to compliment you guys being at Obvi and leaning into this a little bit, but it's thinking about omni-channel, just as a, like thinking about retail as a channel rather than just thinking about, okay, I want to do D to C pure play and that's it. Like, hey, what can we do to scale in stores? What can we do to get beyond? Um, so that is something that I've seen a lot of brands thinking about is, hey, how do we leverage retail plays? And then when it comes into the Google side of things, there are a lot of things that brands can be doing to actually make that, you know, actually try to drive growth in that arena through Google's channels as well. And then maybe a second tactic too. Anything else you're seeing? Yeah, I think the other thing is really leaning into customer cohorts. Like, are you thinking about the behavior? Like, how are you thinking about how your different customer cohorts behave? Um, if you're a subscription business, your high lifetime value folks are going to exhibit different behaviors than your lower lifetime value folks. And then to turn that into growth is how are you plugging that into your, to your media strategy? How are you thinking about speaking to those customers differently so that you can acquire more customers like them efficiently? With the tools that Google offers, right? If say, for example, we do have, at least for Abby, right? We have almost two sets of customers. One that's like into general health and wellness, you know, um, anti-aging, hair, skin, nails, right? Then you have the the other side, which is like very like weight loss heavy, right? Um, by pulling these different segments, like what what can marketers be doing to feed that data back to Google, and how can they like how can they utilize the platform to do that? Sure, of course. So I mean, you can always use you can always import customer lists into Google Ads. That's one, and use that as sort of a signal for your campaigns of like, hey, this is a group of folks that behave this way and I want to, uh, you know, make use of this and help my campaigns be smarter. Got it. What is that now? Is that in the, in the definition of like creating lookalike audiences to kind of expand out or is that quite literally like, Hey, I want to make sure that I'm targeting these people with the right messaging, whether, wherever they are. I think it's about just, you know, leans a little bit more into just reaching people at the right time. Um, and, and if you want to reach those, the, like you think about a retention play versus acquisition, right? Um, how do we retain these people uh, as customers? Well, I think it's all about reaching them um, using using the platforms that you have available to you. So you can, you can reach these people mm -hmm. again. So where, so I've never thought of Google as like a, a retention, mm -hmm channel right uh, at least with like facebook it's like hey here's a here's a list show the ad to them right yeah what is that like where where does that actually live on google like how should i be thinking of where like how should i be thinking of how to reach those people like is that in a search ad is that like youtube display like what it does could that be, look like it could be any or all the above honestly yeah. um yeah what i would encourage you know when i tell this all brands that i run into is that you want to think about this separately from your acquisition strategy. So like make sure that you have that segmented out and, and it depends on the assets that you're using, but it depends on like if you have video assets, there you go. You can use it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't, then there are other options for you as well. It's really all of about taking the assets that you have and then also thinking critically based on what you know about your customers to hit them with a relevant message. Speaking of YouTube, right? I think I think the maybe this is just a myth that's kind of just been out there, but it's like if you're gonna run YouTube, you need to have like high quality video content, right? Is that is that still necessarily the case? Like, can brands utilize like the UGC that they're they're getting from customers or creators? Um, like, what are your what are your thoughts around? Uh, I guess quality of content that's needed for YouTube? This is a great question. Um, in terms of when I think about high quality content, YouTube has a framework called the ABCD framework, which is just attention, branding, connection, and direction, uh, which I, you know, feel free to do research on your own and look up more into detail what that is. But that isn't, in my opinion, that is not something that is exclusive to a specific quality of, of ad or it has to be studio made or whatever. You can do that through any context or any type of content that you have. You just have to be thinking about, are we following these fundamentals? Are we, you know, driving that, you know, that, that attention and, you know, 
then showing our branding and, and driving connection and, and direction action from that. Makes sense. So maybe we just need to hop on a camera and to be like, hey, you know, Avi Founders here. Just wanted to check in, <laughs> see if you need more collagen. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to go back to um, the start of the episode where you're talking more about your role, right? Um, what's your kind of, if, whatever you can share, obviously, what is your, what's your day-to-day piece around like what you're identifying for brands or your partners? Um, what does that kind of look like, right? When you, you hear about like, growth around retail and direct to consumer. Um, what are some of those key things that you're looking for on a day-to-day basis in these brands? Of course. Yeah. So a few things that I look for when I'm working with a brand is really, you know, when they're, they're coming to me typically with a growth goal and they say, we want to hit X in revenue. We have this CAC goal this lifetime value, or, you know, we have a, a, an ROI goal. The first step I do is try to just uncover a little bit more there. Okay. So like how flexible is this? Like, where are we, you know, and what, what role do you want Google to play for you in Mm -hmm. that? Um, so then once I have that lens and I have an idea of where, where and how they sell and whether they're just direct to consumer, whether they also sell in retail, um, that helps inform what I look at internally to determine, you know, the best, the best strategy for, for that brand. Well, okay. Um, and then in terms of like, maybe let's go on the other side of the spectrum. What are some, like, maybe you can give us two mistakes Mm. brands are making right now. Maybe one that's a little bit more obvious, but one that maybe even we're making or, or or just in general people that who are more tuned in are still making. So one big mistake that I see with a lot of, especially digitally native brands is when they go into retail, suddenly those teams start to be a different part of the business. And what, you know, my opinion on this is, is once you enter retail, that is a gigantic source of brand awareness that is driving halos across your business. So they should be talking to your performance teams. Many brands don't. They have this silo set up, which then makes it really, really hard to, to connect the dots. And so I would say that's one, it's obvious to me, but it may not be obvious to most. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other is just first party data and owning as much of that, taking advantage as much of it as you have and soliciting more of it from your customers. I mean, I I, ser- I got served a great email from True Classic a while back uh, and I'm a, I'm a customer of True Classic and I thought this was a fantastic example of what best in class, um, you know, zero party data is. And, and they just said, hey, here's 25% off. Tell us a little bit about yourself. And they started asking me questions about how I spend my time, the media I consume, my you know uh, feelings towards their brand. And I thought to myself after I filled this out as a marketer, wow, Brilliant. this is really cool. This is feedback. And I think a lot of brands don't do that because they're afraid of you know violating some sort of space. Mm. But I think that you know it, it just see what your customers are willing to tell you. Yeah. How would you leverage that data after collecting it? Oh, I would leverage it. If I were a brand operator, I would leverage it in my creative. I would leverage it in my offers, my promotions, based on if I had asked about what my customers thought about promotions, like, hey, would you rather, if I were thinking about this hypothetically, I would ask a customer, would you rather have uh, 5% off or would you rather have a free surprise item? And you know that would then determine how I plan my inventory, how I do all these things strategically, as an operator to move my business forward. Got it. You mentioned first-party data, or I guess even zero-party data, just collection on that, right? Um, how would we? How should marketers be leveraging that, that data, and giving that back to Google? So. This is where there's an interesting uh, point. I don't think all of it can be used by any given platform in my opinion i I don't think you can there are limits there in terms of what you can in terms of what you can leverage i think if you know if you have set ideas about the kinds of interests that your customers have the kinds of um behaviors like where do they like to go travel when they travel um are they into certain kinds of sports teams do they utilize that use it exactly use it in your marketing use it in terms of how you might think about telling google hey, like I know that my customers like to watch football on Sundays. 
So I want to reach, I'm going to, when I run advertising on YouTube, I want to reach football fans. Um, there are a lot of ways to do that, but that's just one example that comes to mind. Yeah, no, that's smart. Chew on this is sponsored by one crucial strategy that we just can't ignore as D2C brands, and that's email and SMS. We'll be sending a ton, and guess who's our go to? We use Sendlane. It's not just another tool, it's a revolution. With real time segmentation, you're reaching users with precision when you hit send on that email or SMS. The reporting UI, you may ask, it's a breath of fresh air. Simple, straightforward, and gets right to the point. No more sitting through confusing data and random charts you have no idea about what it's saying. And here's the crown jewel, their customer support. Round the clock, weekends, holidays, 24-7, 365, always open like 7-Eleven. No exceptions, they've got your back always. If you want to elevate your email and SMS game and you're tired of what everyone in the industry is used to using, check out Sendlane and see why Sendlane is the name that's buzzing in everyone's ears. Dive in and you'll thank us later. Now. Let's get back to the episode. What's Google's like overall philosophy on where D 2 C or just, you know, digitally native brands stand? Um, obviously you see this shift happening into omnichannel being important, but what's overall like Google's stance on, you know, are they, are they investing a lot of money in this? Are they, is this something that they're super bullish about? You know, um, obviously given like rising privacy concerns and you seeing money being shifted and being spent in other places too, um, whatever you can share, what is that kind of feeling of Google um, and, and in connection to D2C? So um, what, I, what I can say on my end is I, I feel that, you know, my team exists to support brands like this. So I don't, you know, I'm not, I can't predict the future uh, ever on anything, but I, I, I don't see any reason for anything changing on that front. Um, you know, I, what gives me joy every day is being able to come to brands and help them grow. And uh, I think that this space is a great space to be in because there's so much innovation that happens. I mean, these, yeah. you know, digitally native brands are really trying to are the, products to help people. Are there certain industries that are, at least like poking up to be like, you know, sure bet winners in, in when, when it comes to either categories or industries within D2C that on your end, you get to see as like, holy shit, this is like always a winner. <laughs> well, I do see some category. I mean, it comes down to just business categories and how healthy your margins are. I think if you're in a business where you have better margins, then you can be more aggressive with your marketing. Right. Um, so, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I think like you guys are experiencing that right now as a brand, like you guys are in a good category that's experiencing a lot of growth. And, um, you know, I'd say anybody like you is probably in a strong position. Makes sense. I think thinking about or riffing off of that Google's philosophy, right? Um, some of these other platforms like Meta, TikTok have put out a lot of tools that are allowing marketers to reach, you know, creators, right? So TikTok's affiliate, their shop, like you can literally search through um, whoever you want to kind of get onto like an affiliate commission model or whatever it is, or even on Facebook, it's it's getting um, partnerships, right? So collaborating on content and stuff. Where's Google at in terms of kind of tapping into that creator network? Yeah, so Google has a solution called Brand Connect. It's on YouTube and it allows brands like yours to work with creators and partner with them to reach potential customers um, using content that they make. Yeah. I think I think when like it comes down to like influencer marketing, YouTube is like super underrated because yeah. the content lives there forever. Right. It's like if you are posting on Instagram or TikTok, like chances are you're not really scrolling all the way down to see what they've posted. Right. It's no. it's more so like, all right, here I posted a story. I just posted a reel. You're in that moment. And that literally that moment just lasts that time. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas like YouTube, you know, I'm, I'm into a creator. I go back, I watch a video about some, you know, X, Y and Z search. That video comes up, you know, um, and they did a partnership with, say, Avi that link is there, right? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that lives forever. So I think it's smart. I think it's a really smart approach. I think it could be a, 
a huge contender in this in this market where the the rise and the power of creators is truly still there. I think a lot of people are like, oh, influencer marketing is like kind of like tapped out and stuff. It's like, I don't think they're using the right tools to reach the right people. I don't think that, uh, I think with the rise of TikTok, it's like people became famous overnight and then it yeah. kind of just like disappeared. But like, if you've built the following on YouTube, that means a lot because like viewership over there is, Shoot. You're, you're watching 30 minute long videos, right? Or like day in the life, this and that, and you want to be involved. so. I think I think that's super interesting is when is that going to be like available? Do you have any idea on that? Like any details around there? I mean, it, you can go to the website and check it out. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that that's where I would recommend learning more information there. Yeah. Um, but that's that's where it lives. Awesome. I, I think it'd be cool to shift a little bit into like um, I feel like Google has always been obviously, you know, they maybe tried with Google Plus, but kind of has been like the anti-social platform as much right um because I, I i think they're you know unapologetically very like down to hey when there is intent we're there because of the whole ideals around google and search um but then i think there's this like clear shift shift's not the right word but clear interest peaking in ai and like the chat gpts of the world and i'm sure that's probably at every discussion in some somewhere in Google every day, um, and I think you guys have Bard, right? Is that the is that Google's tool? Yeah, it is Bard. Bard, that's yeah, our, that's our chat. Uh, that's your chat. Um, but do you is there like, you know, I, I, again, when you see the rise of these different social media platforms, I'm sure Google looks at that and says, okay, either we're going to work alongside or see how this affects our business, or we're gonna stay out of the lane because this is not our domain. With ChatGPT and AI and stuff, um, it seems more in line with what Google can probably take over and be the the king of. But how is kind of the AI landscape talked about at Google and and and, and maybe the effects of it in the DTC community? Yeah. Um, so when I think about you know the search space and you know the role AI plays in it, I really I think about it from a perspective of are you like if I were talking to a brand, um, I think about it, okay, like how do people use these kinds of tools? Yeah. Uh, we're asking, we, you know, I use it to get, you know, tailored recommendations for things. And so then you've got to use that, that insight to think about it. Okay, how are you going to leverage that in your, your ad copy and what mm -hmm. you're doing so that you can be present when someone is searching for you, Smart. however that might happen. Um, these technologies, when they get introduced, in my experience, from what I've seen, that you know they change things. But you know that's you just want to be thinking about again from the perspective of the consumer, where are they and how might they be using that? Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's fair. I think I think Google's kind of coming up in the conversation a little bit more, even with the the rollout of like YouTube Shorts, right? It's like it's like oh, I've I've created a TikTok style video will always be TikTok, right? I got to post it to Reels and YouTube Shorts, right? So can you, can you talk a little bit about maybe what's what's going on there? Any like advancements in the future for for that? Is it, you know, what what can we see coming out of uh, YouTube Shorts? YouTube Shorts, yeah. I mean, well, from an ads perspective, it's on lots of different kinds of inventory types. Um, there are lots of different campaign types, I should say. Uh, such as like you can run uh, demand gen campaigns. They just roll. They're in the process of being rolled out. Um, and uh, I'm. I thought that was really exciting. I've noticed it's being a treated as like another portion of of that inventory. So you can reach people uh, who are consuming that media on that on that channel. But that's how I think about it as part of your your ad strategy. And then I mean, so much the better if you're able to produce content there organically is that I mean in my opinion that that just comes back to you know having a presence online and being present where your potential customers are so is it is it the same as like TikTok and Instagram where you can still you can still get that discoverability it's not just who's following you it's like you could go viral on YouTube shorts I I've seen I've seen yeah I've seen brands go viral um but uh you know, I, it's it's hard for me to say whether oh you could or yeah, couldn't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
you know, I, I don't have a magic wand, but, <laughs> uh, but I've seen, I've seen it happen. Right. Yeah. Right. So there is that level of, uh, discoverability. So it just makes sense. It's like, take all your content, repurpose everywhere. Um, cause there's users everywhere, which is really cool to see kind of Google open up another lane of inventory, especially video content that a lot of us are spending a lot of time and resources to create that type of content. Hey guys, we're gonna take a quick break from the episode to analyze some of our top performing ads in our ad account. A lot of people have been asking me, what have you been running, statics, videos? Well, I'm gonna show you our top performing ads utilizing a platform called Motion, which pretty much analyzes all the data of all of our top performing creatives, ROAS, by spend, by CTR, CPCs, everything. So check it out. What's going on guys? Uh, today we will be reviewing some of the ads that we've been testing recently. Um, the last few videos, we've talked about some of our successes. I'm going to talk about some of the failures, right? Because not every test is going to win. Um, so let's take a look at this. Um, motion makes it really easy to really pinpoint where you're not doing really well. Um, whereas in your ad account, you kind of get lost behind a ton of numbers. Um, so clearly we have these two. I already reviewed static number seven. Let's review static number one and see what we can uh, get out of this and find out why this didn't do too well. So try to do this uh, text message style ad, um, right? Put a whole conversation here about how somebody had uh, thyroid fatigue. This was a common um, problem that I saw in our comments and I wanted to kind of attack this angle um, utilizing this uh, this uh, this style, right? So here's something, you know, spent 2200, had a 0.77. Um, CPC isn't that great. Um, what I think... The problem here is, again, very similar to the last ad that, that didn't do too well was this is very specific, right? This is very specifically talking about a, a problem around thy uh, thyroid fatigue. Uh, you're clicking on it and you're getting to a landing page that isn't really talking about how the product relates to fixing an issue like thyroid fatigue, right? So again, while I think this has got some meaningful spend, right, and, and spend being uh, what it is, um, it, it essentially tells you that it has the legs to perform, but there is something uh, that's blocking conversions. And, and and what I think it is, is probably the landing page, right? So what I would probably do is come back on this. Um, I, I know that thyroid fatigue is a very uh, important issue and, and a lot of our customers do suffer from it and, and the product does help it. I would probably go back and create a, um, a landing page that talks more about how the product uh, attacks, you know, the, this issue and then rerun this and see if we can kind of get it to convert a little bit better. Um, so that's what you do when you analyze your ads, you're trying to understand why it didn't work, um, learn from the failures and, and keep testing. So hopefully this helps. But the format of this ad is really cool. I'm probably gonna use it for something else. Um, so take it, utilize it, learn from it. If you're looking to sign up for Motion, click the link in the description for a special offer today. Now, let's get back to the episode. So I guess recently the the elephant in the room, which is one of the questions I really wanted to ask you was um, GA, right? And GA4. Um, that has been, I mean, we've we've been using Google Analytics since we started, like just years, years ago, you know, like years, almost on a decade, right? Um, and then the transition to GA4 has like, I don't want to say it's, it's gotten a bad rep, but I also think it's like, it's just, it's something new, right? And anytime somebody has to learn something new, it becomes frustrating, right? But I'm just curious what where your thoughts are on um, GA4. Um, I would imagine a lot of time has gone into building this and there's obviously a reason for it, right? So I'm curious what Google's take on that transition really is. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, a few things. I mean, uh, kudos to you guys for being longtime users of, of GA. Um, I think that in, in my experience from what I've seen, it, you have to consider the changing privacy environment that we live in and that users want, you know, people on the internet want to have more of a say in what they share with, you know, advertisers or large, large tech platforms. And some of the, based on what I can see is that some of the intentionality went behind that while also at the same time preserving a sense of measurement, a sense of understanding of, hey, like if I run an ad and somebody comes to my website, I want to have an understanding as a brand what happens afterwards. So there was 
from what I can see, there was some intentionality on meeting everybody halfway uh, without compromising the the integrity for uh, internet users. Makes sense. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I guess as we move into this like cookie-less world and attribution being such a, a buzzword like every other day, um, I guess we just have to play by the rules, right? That's, yeah, play it, so. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> It's tricky. You can't like, uh, there's not too many like, um, dangerous stunts you can pull anymore. Like it's, uh, <laughs> you just have to be like, which makes it, I think it's, it makes it fun. Cause like everyone has to follow those rules. So now you just have to be extra creative within, within those barriers. So we, we just rolled out to Walmart. Um, one of the, one of the interesting channels that we keep talking about, like, Hey, we really want to get this going is always been connected TV, right? And when you think connected TV, for me, because I'm actually a user of like YouTube TV, and so for me, it's like I've seen so many of these DTC brands put up their commercials up there, right? So it's like Harry's or Hims or whatever it is. Um, can we talk a little bit about like CTV efforts? Like what should brands be doing and how can they use Google for that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there's an interesting stat behind this that uh, eMarketer published a few months ago, which is that 45% of watch time on YouTube now occurs on the TV screen, uh, wow. which that's insane. I know it, it surprised me too. I mean, I watch a lot of videos on my TV at home on YouTube, so that, that made a lot of sense. But I think <laughs> in terms of like what brands can be doing is really if you are thinking about CTV, you should be thinking about YouTube and you should be thinking about, you know, what what a, what you're going to pl- what you're going to play there especially like if you want to make it retail focused like think about the SKUs you have in retail and featuring that in some way but yeah that's like the one thing i would say outside of that um and what else is cool about that is you can leverage what are called custom segments so if somebody searched for a particular term or a brand or a product you can make sure that you reach them when they're on YouTube. And mm-hmm. especially you think about the TV effect, like, hey, I just went around and I was looking for this and now I'm seeing an ad for something that I need. I think that's really, really powerful to create that aha moment between yeah. a brand and customer. That's all. I guess the ads that show up on like YouTube TV, right, versus like watching videos on YouTube, are those separate inven- like places of inventory for Google? Like, do I have to run my ads separately? or differently to hit both? Or is it kind of like, I can just run all at once? So this is a great question. And I I have to double check on a lot of those details. Um, there is a difference from what I, what I the last time I checked on this, there there is a difference in terms of like, YouTube TV is not YouTube on the TV screen. That's right. like a different yeah. property. But regarding those other like aspects of that, I'd have to, I'd have to circle back on that. Cool, sounds good. So do choose. Let's do it. Yeah, cool. So at the end of every episode, we love the guests to kind of pick one single chew to um, to give the users and to to basically take back and um, implement in their business today. Yep. So what would that one thing be um, coming from you? Great question. Um, I would say if you have video content and you're not using it on YouTube yet, you should be um and really thinking about again those other pieces we discussed the the first party data all of those signals and understanding you know your business and your customers and leveraging that to inform your buys there awesome chew on that that chew on that that was great (laughs) if you want more from us follow us on twitter follow us on instagram follow us on tiktok and check out the website chewonthis.io